Beloved among you, I appeal to the fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, hmm. but eager to serve. Amen. You guys now may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word as we take a dive into roles as elders, presbyteros, pastors. What is their role within the church? Why is there so much emphasis on elders and deacons? Why do we not have high priests and lower courses of priests and, and different other positions within the church? Is it on? It's on? Maybe. Kind of. Sort of. It's not church without technical difficulties. There it goes. So in shepherding the flock of God, here Peter gives very interesting directions. There we go. As we begin in verse 1, we have to ask the question, once again, what is the therefore, therefore? Church joke, I need... Brent, you need your drum kit so you can go bottom each time that comes up. But it's a legitimate question, right? What is the therefore, therefore? Peter just spent three whole chapters talking about relationships from slaves and masters, those being oppressed, those in persecution. Because of your situation in life, he says to exhort. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, we'll read it again and dig into it. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Here, Peter, if anyone had seen what sufferings Christ had gone through, what he himself would soon after writing this experience himself. He knew firsthand the persecution. He knew firsthand the trials. Now he is saying, I exhort or I charge or beseech the other elders. This isn't to just the general congregation. This is to those that have been called and separated as pastors over the church. It's a very high calling. As James says in James 3, let not many of you become teachers, for there's a stricter judgment. And the main role of a pastor is of a teacher. The language used predominantly in the New Testament, in the Greek, for an elder, slash what we would call today pastors, presbyteros. We get the term Presbyterian form of government or the Presbyterian church from this word. But it means so much more than just a system of government. It's talking about the role of shepherd within a congregation. Not just one who rules, but one who steers and guides and protects. Unfortunately, in our American culture and our society, we don't want elders or pastors, we want CEOs. We want people able to lead an organization, but not able to shepherd. We want people to be, cast a great vision and a direction and a great catchphrase for your slogan for the church, but have no relationship with the sheep. We want somebody who's great organizationally, but has no discernment as to the spiritual nature of the people inside of the pews. You want somebody that is able to gather more people and to fill up this front row, which like no one ever sits at, but then not be able to tell the difference between goats and sheep. It's a dangerous place we've put ourselves in. Unfortunately, many of those in that position, acting as CEOs, when that day comes and they stand before the one who died for the church, Scripture says that they're going to be double judged. That's a scary spot to be. I was mentioning this week 
about some of those who have been self-deceived to think that they've been called to this position, that they, are, they want to lead large, con large congregations and to give, especially those that teach falsely. I don't want to be in the same room as they're judged. When the books are opened, Revelation chapter 20, and it, everything that is read that they have done, for many of those, Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. But, but didn't we? Yes, you did all of these things, but you didn't know me. In America, all you have to do is go get a piece of paper and, and get some people to set, ordain you or to license you, and you can start a pop-up church anywhere in the United States. There's no accountability, no direction, and yet, many people depend on those persons for their spiritual direction and welfare. It's a scary place to be. This here, your first fill in the blank, or your, excuse me, your second fill in the blank this morning, your fellow elder. Peter, of anybody, could say, I'm the chief honcho, I've been the director in Jerusalem for forever, you guys have to listen to what I say, no matter what. I'm like one of the last apostles living, so deal with it. No, he didn't say that. Instead, he says, he's addressing other pastors, and he says, I am your fellow elder. We are working together towards the same purpose, the same goal, the same cause. It totally destroys the idea that there was a single episcopate, there was a single person in charge in Jerusalem, we don't see a single bishop in Jerusalem until the 4th century. Consistently, there's letters being written to the church in Jerusalem saying to the elders that are in Jerusalem, plural. Throughout the early church, they practice what we would call a plurality of elders. That there's not just a senior pastor, but in fact that all of the presbyteros, the pastors, are equal. They may have different responsibilities. They have a, a specific goal that they have been called to in their ministry. Some are called to kids, some are called to um, couples, some are called to older folks, some are called to the congregation. But they are considered equal. There may be one that in Latin is called para inter pares, first among equals. Someone that God has called to lead and guide and to even shepherd the shepherds, as we see at some churches. But they are of equal rank or equal distinction. For Peter to say this is very humbling of himself, but also shows the great responsibility of the others in whom he's addressing. This isn't something to just be taken lightly. Uh, in going through seminary, I, c I can tell you, uh, the dropout rate for seminary is insane, 70 to 80 percent, as well as those that do make it through seminary, many of them have never been called into pastoral ministry. Because unfortunately in America, there is no vetting process for most seminaries. A hundred years ago, it used to be you have to get a letter from your church affirming your call. They would interview family members and friends. And then they would interview you as well and discern whether or not you are called into the ministry before starting your education. Now, if you have the money, you can get the paper. And for many churches, well, if you have the paper, that's good enough. It's a dangerous place to be in America that kind of everyone can parade themselves around as, as God's man and yet not be called into the ministry. Yes, is training important? Yes. Is calling more importanter? Yes, I purposely said that wrong, kids. I think so. And Peter's going to get into that. He witnessed the sufferings of Christ. Literally, the word witness there is martyr. 
that he gave his martyrian, he, he gave his witness that he himself would suffer in a similar way as Christ. At least his tradition tells us. He didn't want to be crucified in the same way as his Lord. And so he asked to be crucified upside down. Now this is maybe spurious is maybe the best way of recording it, but at least tradition tells us that he was, met his end that way. But either way, he gave his testimony or his witness with his life. One of the greatest evidences as to the truth of the Christian message is that if the disciples had gotten together and Jesus really was still in the tomb, you're not going to get 12 men to go to their deaths for a fake story. Not going to happen. Peter, among anybody, especially living later than some of the others, would have seen the other disciples being martyred, giving of their testimony, and him going, eh, no, you know, I've carried on this lie for too long. But no, instead, every single one of them John, in some cases, a little excluded there. He lived a ripe old age. But he still had many opportunities. They tried to boil him alive. He gave of his testimony many times, but God preserved his life. The big question is, is as Peter is talking to these shepherds, he's saying, I, I just spent three whole chapters talking about persecution and endurance. Are you going to endure as I have endured? He's probably much younger elders, pastors, and going, do, do you have the fortitude to carry through the next 20, 30, 40 years of your life suffering the way in which I have suffered? It's not really a question we ask in America. Now, our sister churches all across the world have to ask this question often. That's why many churches in the world have a difficult time finding pastors, because the world knows to scatter the sheep, you take out the shepherd. I relayed the story recently of my friend Tom who went to China to smuggle Bibles. He met at the tea house with the pastor of the local church he was dropping these Bibles off to. After they get done and the exchange is made, the secret police were waiting right outside the doors of the tea house. They didn't grab my friend, Pastor Tom but they grabbed the pastor of the church. He was already in his 60s, and this is 20-some-odd years ago now. He was sentenced to 35 years in a labor camp. He's not been heard of since and is probably not with us. Probably went home to be in glory by now. We don't understand what that is like. Raising up pastors, we've got great seminaries, and we pump out all these pastors, but how many of them would be willing to do where that Chinese pastor did to get God's word to his people. We're not under the same restrictions. We're not under the same persecution. Oh, we might talk about it in seminary. There might be a week in one class where we talk about persecution. But it's just something off in the distance. It's something, oh, it'll never happen. We kind of fool ourselves in the a false sense of security. Come on. Verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. There's a lot of qualifications here for the pastors. A lot of, but also a lot of indictments against the American church. Here he says, I'm going to chuck this clicker. Shepherd the flock of God where? We've already looked at the, the person of the shepherd. That he's not just some mucky muck, not just some priest that's off, that he knows the sheep. That he's in there getting muddy. Would you really trust a shepherd that doesn't have mud up to his knees? The shepherd's also going to smell, right? He's going to smell like the sheep. Do sheep smell pretty? No. 
We were in South Dakota for three years. You know a rancher because he smells just like the cows. As they call it out there, it's the smell of money. That's what they call it. It's the smell of money. But you know of what he does by how he smells. In many ways, you will know a real pastor by if he looks like the congregation, if he's with the congregation, that he's not just immaculately and perfectly wearing the, you know, the nice whitest robes, and yet there's no dirt on him. That you shepherd the flock of God, but where? Where does Peter tell us here? Among us. Here. Not out there, not in Port Huron, not in Marysville, not in Fort Gratiot. We're right here on this corner at the beginning of a dirt road in Goodalls. So much of American Christianity is shepherds who want to be shepherds of multi campus locations, and, and they shepherd here, there, and everywhere, and they spread themselves so thin. Instead, they need to be worried about the sheep that are in this pen. The sheep in which he's been called to lead. Not worrying about other people's sheep. I'm not interested in sheep swapping. Although a majority of American Christianity is very much concerned with sheep swapping. Instead, I am concerned with the sheep that God brings here. To fill up this pew and those couple of seats back there that are still empty. Not about grabbing from Blue Water Free Methodist or, or grabbing from any of the other churches in our area. You know what they, uh, you know what we, we used to call people like that 150 years ago? Thieves. In the Wild West, there would be horse thieves. What would happen to horse thieves? They'd get hung or shot. And yet, we think it's perfectly okay to, to go poach in other people's churches. Them's fighting words around where I come from. Shepherd the flock of God among you. But then, Peter gives these great directions, great counsel for those that are elders. Not to be to give oversight. It's been interesting in all my years of ministry to, to meet shepherds, and some of them are very detail-oriented, almost to the, the point of micromanagement. Thankfully, I am not that way. <laughs> if you guys have gotten to know me over the last 10 months, I, I'm not a micromanager. Um, I don't want to change the font that you have on your newsletter or on your flyer to a different type of font, or a different size font, or your spacing's wrong. Instead, it's about the big picture. Is the direction that we're going, going to shepherd the flock of God? It may not be the methods that I would use. It may not be the words I would use. It may not be the material I would use. But it may certainly be the direction in which we need to go. So many times I've seen congregations be not just oversight, but have the pastor so in not only just people's lives, but telling people what to do. And the fact of that they're running everybody's life so that they, they don't even have time to run their own lives because they're so busy telling Lauren where she should go to school or telling telling Hannah how to write her fours on her, her math test. What? <laughs> what? I don't need help with that. I'm perfectly good at math. But obviously also not under compulsion. One thing that hopefully you've never seen and will never see. Men that call themselves shepherds that browbeat their sheep with the Bible. To put them into total submission and the cowering and fear 
Because he alone determines who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Or that he beats you up with the, the sins that so easily beset you and is quick to remind you of how you failed this week. Dangerous place to be. It's just right in our neighborhood. Those that would squash someone's growth in Christ because of their wanting to control their lives and to have power over them. Sad to see. To hear the stories of people who either call or, in fact, just this week, a internet message through Facebook. Someone coming to me and telling me of, of how their pastor is controlling them by uh, shoving the Old Testament law down their throats and that they have to abide by all of these rules and regulations. And that constantly when they don't obey, the pastor's going, well, you're, you're not going to make it to heaven this week, but if you do really good and follow all of these things, maybe by the end of the week you'll be good and you'll end up going to heaven. Have yeah, have mercies, right. But also, number three here, that they do so voluntarily. That this voluntarily, much like in America, in many states, are at-will employment opportunities. That whether the employer or the employee at any point can say, nope, I'm done, or you're done. In the same way, sheep and the shepherd have a similar relationship. That it's a voluntary relationship. That it shouldn't be under compulsion because I'm the only man that God has put here and you have to listen to Chris. Instead, the sheep can go, meh, and bail. Unfortunately, many churches aren't willing to do that. Instead, they often put up with an individual that browbeats them. Or especially sheep that are willing to put up with false teaching for 10, 20, 30, 40 years because touch not God's anointed. By the way, wrong context. But number, going back. But also that this has to be according to God's will. One of the biggest things, going back to the qualifications for a pastor, that they must be called by God and that the people of God recognize it, authorize it, and place that person in a position. Just because the current pastor is the son of the previous pastor means nothing. Or just because they come from a long line of pastors doesn't mean squat. It's not about lineage, it's about calling. And if a church is having a hard time discerning calling, if individuals are having a hard time to distinguish calling, you can... Ask other ministers in the area. There used to be something called ordination boards in which you would get a bunch of pastors together and you'd grill the person going up for ordination to really make sure, number one, they're called, number two, that they've been educated, number three, able to serve in that position well and not flounder. That's another thing that's kind of gone out the window. Yes, it's stressful, as it should be, but... Uh, John, did you have an ordination board? Yeah. Yeah. As it should be. But once again, America, oh, we don't need that anymore. We'll just, yeah, yeah you're our next pastor. You're good. It must be according to God's will. How lightly do we think of God's will and God's word that we're willing to throw it aside because of our culture? because of our wants and because of our needs. Or just plain out ignorance. Is that going to pass the litmus test when it comes down to it? Oh, well, we put him as our pastor, but we didn't really know what, what we should be looking for in a pastor. We didn't really know, uh, you know, what the biblical qualifications were. You know, this guy seemed like a really nice guy. Oh, we just kind of stuck him in there. Sheep get what sheep get when that happens. 
And that old kind of adage, you get what you pay for. But in the pastoral role, you get what you investigate into. Surprisingly, there's only been two churches that I've been at that have actually done a background check and called my references. Did you guys hear that right? Some of you should be like shaking your heads. Only two churches actually called my references and did a background check. If there's only been two churches for me, you gotta question the other churches around going, how deeply are they really looking into the people in which they're calling as bishop, episcopos, pastor, elder in their congregations? And lastly, I, I, I love this phrase. It kinda reminds me of a line out of Robin Hood Men in Tights. There's a character in the, in the show called Filthy Luca. Reminds me of Filthy Lucre, his version. Last, year, last verse here in uh, verse 2 is that they are not for sordid gain, or as the King James puts it, after filthy lucre, dirty money. I can't tell you how many. You just got to turn on the TV, turn on the radio, go on the internet to see pastors, quote unquote, that are after filthy lucre or dirty money. People, once again, that are controlling over people and saying, well, you need to give my ministry money or else God's word is not going to get out. I'm sorry. How, how many pastors are there in Point Huron? 100 and something? If he doesn't use that guy, he's got plenty of more options to use. Or better yet, as I said earlier, he could use an angel. Now, the big question is, is and this is one of those questions that's going to have to wait until I get to heaven. God, why do you choose to use us? He sent angels in the past. Why doesn't he have, as the book of Revelation calls it, the angel at the church of, we got seven churches. God calls angels, the messengers to the churches in the form of men. Don't ask me why he does it. I wouldn't do it that way because I would get sick and fed up of, of the men don't follow, don't do, and don't say. But God's a lot more patient than Chris is, thankfully. But so many are after filthy lucre. I don't know. Brother Wrong will probably tell you of the, the, the pastors in his area and the ministries that were after filthy lucre. Those that hang your salvation based upon your checkbook your faithfulness to the church about how many zeros are at the end of that tithing check or how much faith you really have. Thankfully, that's why I'm glad Stacy is around so I don't touch the money, I don't look at the money, I don't know what anybody gives. And it's such a relief off of my head to not being responsible, not knowing. Because then I can approach each and every one of you on the same footing, week in and week out, without knowing, without being partial, as James says in James chapter 2. These ones that are after sordid gain, those that are fleecing their congregations for their next big Learjet. My, my last $50 million jet wasn't good enough. I need a $70 million jet off of the backs of their congregation. You know how many people that could feed? You know how many tracts and Bibles we could print with that kind of money? You know what type of VBS we could do with $70 million? <laughs> All right, those, those of you involved in VBS, your eyes are just going wide, you know. We'd have the biggest VBS ever for $70 million, you know. Youth for Christ could, could reach a whole lot more schools and have the materials that they need with $70 million. And yet these men are fleecing the flock, dripping them for every penny that they possibly can for dirty money. Heaven forbid if we ever get to the, path, to the point in which we're looking after dirty money. Instead, I am 
perfectly fine. When, when I see the, the numbers that go up here each Sunday, I'm saying God has blessed us in and through his people. And whatever funds that come in is what God has brought. I am not worried about paying the bills. I'm not worried about um, the capital in which we need. Because I'm a firm believer in where God leads, he provides. So I don't have that stress that many other pastors have about where's those numbers. Making sure to, to put extra pressure on you guys and putting it in the bulletins so you guys know, hey, by the way, this is what we brought in last week. This is what we need on. It's such a relief off of my head. So that I don't have the opportunity nor the option to be like so many others and pursue dirty money. That's the kind of person you want. There's plenty of people on TV to give your money to. But the big question is, is when you do give your money at church, do you see where it's going to? Do you see what the church is doing and making an impact to its neighborhood and to the congregation? That's what the funds are going to. So that as God brings in new people here that fill up these seats, that's where those funds are going to. One of the greatest things, as I close, we went really long today, but that's okay. Christy and I, when we were in a college group, shortly after both being engaged and then been married, the church was always, why aren't the, the young people giving to the general fund? It's because we as a group wanted to see the effects of what we gave. And so the church was often surprised uh, at the things that we would give to. A lot of, several times we'd go down to Skid Row. And the church would be surprised at the hundreds of lunches that we just as a, co a small college group of like 30 kids was able to prepare and to send down and to give. Or uh, one winter we bought, uh, I can't count how many blankets to pass out. And it was because a lot of that became sacrificial giving because those that were involved understood and saw exactly where their money was going to. And so they were willing to give more because they saw its effects. In the same way here at Mount Pleasant, I want all of us to be able to see where every penny that comes in comes to where it makes a difference. Not just giving because we have to give, not just giving because pastors preaching a sermon about money and no, this wasn't intended to be a sermon about money. But instead being, we want clean money. We want money that honors God. Not just the form. Not just as Jesus going into the temple and they're exchanging money for, for the temple money from regular money. I'm not talking about the form of money. What I'm talking about is our collective time, treasure, and talent. That it's not just the coins that are in your pockets or the dollar bills or the checks. But you would be amazed at what I see every single week about people that give their time, their treasure, and their talent. I could pick out a few people today, but I'm not going to for their sakes to embarrass them too much. But there's people here more than I am giving their time, treasure, and talent to the church. And you all see the effects of what they do, whether you know that it's from them or not. That's what I call a healthy church. The things are being done in such a way as not to glorify an individual, but to build up the church. In the same way here, Peter is saying, if you have shepherds that are like this, that just give oversight, that are voluntarily leading and guiding that aren't after the dirty money, that that is going to build the church. That if you find faithful elders like that, God is going to bless that ministry. Not just increase it by numbers with goats. Not just increase the number that's up on the board because of pressuring for money. But instead, God is going to bring those in whom he calls right to these pews. With that, 
Let me pray. Lord, so much. So much in these, even just these two verses. Lord, such an indictment about our culture and our society. Lord, may we not be like our culture and our society. May instead we look to the author and perfecter of our faith. May we look to you as our source of provision. That as we worship you and as we move forward, may we be more concerned about those that are not here. May we not be worried about what a church down the road is doing and what the sheep are doing at a different church, but instead right here at Mount Pleasant. Lord, may we consider these words as we worship you and prepare also our minds and our stomachs for the food that's downstairs for us. Lord, may our stomachs not grumble too much to distract us from uh, the, the words in which we sing. We give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. With that, go and stand and stretch. As you've heard me yak for long enough as the ladies come up to lead us in our last.